Cool.fm is the perfect station for music lovers who enjoy a mix of adult pop, modern country, and classic hits. Our unique blend of different genres creates an awesome listening experience that you won't find anywhere else. With Cool.fm, you don't have to constantly change stations to hear the music you love. Just download the Live 365 app and start listening to our curated selection of modern adult and country hits, as well as the classics you know and love. So tune in to Cool.fm and start enjoying the best of all your favorite music in one place. Hi, I'm Marcus Nasso, co-creator and writer of By the Horns and Voracious. You can find me at marcuson.com and you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today on this rapid fire interview with a very talented and creative person. So who is our guest today? Our guest today is not only a podcast host, but he is also a very talented comic creator. We're joined today by the ever talented Marcus and Nasso. How are you doing today? Doing great, Kurt. Thanks for having me on. No, it's good to have you. I happened to watch a couple of interviews with yourself and Jason recently, and and one of them was was most notably uh, Lauren with the Cooking with Creative. So I thought that was a really fun interview uh, that I got to watch of both of you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, we, we love Lauren. We love going on in the neighborhood and <laughs> talking about the book. And we actually won five awards on the neighborhood. We got nominated for five, and we were on the award show. And we won all five. It was it was crazy. It was a really great night. For those that don't know anything about yourself, as a creative person tell us who you are and what you're bringing to two geeks talking yeah i mean i'm the co-creator and writer of the epic sci-fi fantasy series by the horns it's published by scout comics and i'm also a host on the metalheads podcast which comes out once a month the love of music and the love of comics i mean what better way to be a geek in this day and age right it's great. I mean, I actually did a uh, press a record, did music for By the Horns for the first issue and uh, started a record company and uh, a friend of mine and his band Arctic Sleep did two songs for the for the comic. So I've kind of merged the, the two worlds. It's been fun. Yeah, I, I've seen a bit of By the Horns. Of course, they have a Kickstarter campaign currently ongoing, which I happen to support as well, too. So I definitely want to dive into that as well. But Thanks, Kurt. Oh, hey, anytime, because I, I just, I love the colors. I love the characters. I, you know, what is By the Horns all about? Yeah, it, By the Horns, it's an epic sci-fi fantasy, but it's about a heartbroken warrior named Elodie and her telepathic wolf friend, Sajin. And they want to murder all the unicorns in the world for destroying their lives. Elodie's husband is trampled by unicorns in the beginning of the book. The problem is that unicorns are really hard to find. So they have to travel the realm looking for them. They end up discovering there's a greater threat to the world. There are these four wind wizards who are extracting magic from all the creatures on the continent of Salvis. And in order to stop them, El Sajin has to team up with two unicorns who don't know they plan to murder them later. And Elodie can rip off the horns, the unicorn horns, and merge them together to form mythic weapons. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah. You're just starting right off with a bang to begin with. I just love it. That's, that's <laughs> now, now I think I, it's pretty unique. Out of 15 years of, of reading comics and of course having this show, I, I've never heard that given as a summary or not even close. So that that is a unique story. Yeah. And you've interviewed a lot of people, so I definitely take that as a huge compliment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You could use this as a tag in your next book. I've never seen this storyline in 15 years of interviewing people. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we got, um, and By the Horns, Dark Earth 7 is coming out next week, and it's out on Wednesday, the 15th of March, and uh, it's the 15th issue in our ongoing story. So we did the first series was eight issues, By the Horns, that's what's getting collected on the, the Kickstarter, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Mm -hmm. By the Horns, Dark Earth is the second series that's going to run 12 issues, but it just basically picks up right after uh, the first eight issues, and we even have legacy numbering on the back for it because we just consider it an ongoing series. So of course you mentioned your co-creator and, and who is the other amazing person that is working with you on this uh, series? Yeah, Jason Muir is my uh, co-creator and the artist and he also does the letters in the book. He's a, a friend of mine who uh, broke into comics with me with our, with our book Voracious which is, I'm sure you haven't heard this premise before either, Kurt, but it's a <laughs> chef who travels through time, kills dinosaurs and serves them at a restaurant in the present. 
And we even have recipes in every single issue with dinosaur meat. And then we oh, give you the substitute meat so you can actually make the recipes. I, I lived in New York. I grew up in New York. And I ended up moving to Chicago, mm. I don't know, I think probably year 2000. First thing I had to do was find a, a comic book shop. And Jason happened to work at that comic book shop. You know, we weren't really friends, but I would see him every week. And, and he was going off to art school. I had done a contest online to write a script for this book called The Authority. It was just some random contest somebody did. Like, hey, I want to try to write a script for this. And I won the contest script and he drew a few pages. He went off to college. I didn't see him for like 10 years. <laughs> a mutual friend of ours who was the manager of that shop had an idea for a comic. I was still friends with him because I used to play softball with him. And he asked me to collaborate with, with him on the book and another guy. So I started doing that, but it got to be too much with three different writers on it. But he had sent some of the ideas to Jason because he was still in touch with him. And Jason had drawn some of the characters. So when that whole thing fell apart, I just contacted Jason and said, hey, you know, it doesn't look like this book's going on, going to get off the ground, but I have a few other ideas. Would you be interested in having a beer and talking about it? So that's how we started uh, working on Voracious. And now by the horns is... We want to do something different than that. We want to do like a fantasy book. And so I pitched him this idea and uh, the rest is history. You got it at Scout and uh, now we're almost on issue 15 here. I love those types of stories because, you know, you show how your local comic book store is more important than ever, not only in connecting you with your, your favorite comics, but also in making connections. So that's incredible mm -hmm. to see for sure. And it was cool too, because he had drawn those authority pages, did like three or four pages. I saved them all that time, all that 10 years. And so when I met him out for beers and we were talking about books, I brought him those pages back and gave it to him. And he, he totally forgot he even worked on them. And now, you know, Jason's become a really good friend. And he's an amazing artist. And if you look at Voracious, like when we start, he's a solid artist. I, I liked his art from the beginning, but if you look at that first issue of Voracious, and then you look at the last issue of By the Horns, it's incredible how much he's grown as an illustrator. And he's just really dedicated to it. He always is looking for ways to improve, become better. And I mean, I already think he's one of the best artists in comics now. Continually blows me away. Being co-creators, you have a great collaboration and working relationship. I can hear that. I can hear your admiration and I can hear you describing his Style. What is it that he brings to the table that balances you out creatively? And what do you bring to the table that balances him creatively? I think I really like Jason's clean lines mm. and the way he emotes characters. Because my writing has a lot of emotion to it. It can be funny, but it can be real serious and sad. And I try to mirror what life is like. The ideas for my books are pretty fantastical and strange and different. The characters are always grounded and real life. And so I think Jason just really brings that out in the characters. Yeah, he can draw really great action sequences and stuff. But for me, the best part about a comic is the, is the characters. You know, that's how you get into a comic book. It goes, you're going to follow those characters. You need somebody who's going to be able to really show their depth in their face, their, their all their emotions, even if they're just in the background. And we have a character named Evelyn who's a floating eyeball in our, in our book. And she's almost like an emoticon for everything that's happening in a scene. You'll see her in the background, even if she's not actively speaking to somebody. And you'll see the emotion on her face and you'll get the context of the scene, which is really cool. And Jason is amazing at that. It's a floating eyeball. And somehow he's able to like make her have these intense emotions. So as far as what I bring to it, I mean, I think Jason and I have a similar sense of what we like in comic books. I think he enjoys drawing just characters that are fully realized, that uh, are expressive. He likes to do a lot of action sequences, so I try to put that in there as well. Yeah, the kinds of comics that we both like are, are similar. We're both really big fans of Nightwing, Invincible, books like that that have a lot of great action, but there's like a heart and a levity to the characters, but also a gravitas too. So hopefully, you know, I give him a nice fun stuff to draw. What's the most misunderstood aspect about fantasy that maybe people who don't, don't follow the genre understand? Oh, that's an interesting question. That's true, because, you know, we get a lot of people who say, I don't really read fantasy, but I read your book and I kind of like that too. A lot of people said that to me. I'm like, I, I have to I have to read your book, even though I, would, I don't read any other fantasy. So I think what it is is that the idea of having these huge worlds with untold numbers of creatures and historic background and all that seems very daunting for people to get into it. A lot of people like more real life, slice of life kind of things. Can't wrap their head around something that's so fantastical sometimes. I like all kinds of fantasy, but when I write, I like to write it 
you know, from the character's perspective, I don't want to overwhelm you with all of the information about the world. I want you to be able to discover the world as the characters discover it. And I think that's part of the reason why people tend to like our fantasy book, even if they don't like fantasy, because it's focused on Elodie and Sage in the beginning and, and the journey they're going on. And as you go, you'll learn more about the world, but, you know, you're not going to like four score and, you know, 30,000 years ago, this earth was built. We don't do anything like that. We do things like travel maps where you get to see what the characters are going through, like what the landscape is like. And we have, you pop out little different monsters and then there's like almost like a journal that Elodie writes and she's talking about the monsters that they've encountered and how to kill them and stuff like that. And it's a quick page to show you, okay, this is where they are, this is where they're going, and this is what they're going through without having to like bog you down and tons of information. I think that's what it is really for fantasy. Some people just don't like weird creatures and <laughs> unicorns and stuff too. I mean, how can people not like unicorns unless they trampled their loved ones? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> We've had people um, look at the book and see unicorns and think that it's like a kid's book, I guess. So that happens sometimes too, because there's bright color and all that. And they assume certain things about the book. But of course, you know, it's really more of an adult book. And I, I'm not the biggest fan of unicorns either. That's why I wanted to write the book. And I had an idea, like, how do I make unicorns more interesting? There's these, like, sacred, like, amazing creatures that are, like, the embodiment of good and light. What if they weren't? What if people thought of them as, as evil? I like playing with that idea. More. You couldn't call the book Unicorns Are Assholes, right? <laughs> <laughs> Could have, <but> yes. <laughs> Fuck you, Unicorns was in the, the running for a title. But. It was like top three, but it made it to fourth. You know, just like. Yeah. What challenges do comic creators face in today's world that needs to be addressed? Getting paid for your art? Yeah. <laughs> We make comics because we love it. I have to make comic books because it's just who I am. I have to create. But it's just really hard to do books and make a good amount of money unless you're going to get in a big indie publisher like Amy, maybe Boom or, of course, Marvel and DC. You know, that's the thing. Like, Jason is, is fast. He can draw a page a day, but he's still... In order to draw a book, it takes him a whole month, and he, that's mostly what he has to do. If he's not really making any money on it, and we don't make money on the front end for him, we get royalties and stuff, but it's not enough to cover costs and to make a living off. So it would be nicer to you know find a way to make more money or to have publishers who can actually put that up instead of uh, being totally based on sales, I guess. But it's tough because we've seen a lot of publishers uh, go under too. <laughs> like, uh, who was it? Aftershock uh, declared mm -hmm. bankruptcy not too long ago. I don't know. That's why we have Kickstarter, I guess. I think comics is moving towards that model, to be honest. And we've, out, we've had it for a long time. And now you see even Boom, I just mentioned them, the expanse on there and made like $1.5 million or something. Even the bigger publishers are doing that because they're just not making enough money by putting out comic. Being able to do these creative works, these great comic books you need funds you see a big publisher like boom you see marvel and dc have even jumped into that foray as well too when it comes to to crowdfunding do you feel that it cheapens the indie scene that that crowdfunding was meant for oh it's a good question i don't think so i don't think so i i think uh, the more projects you have on there maybe the more people are going to find other projects i mean i don't know if boom is uh, like pushing other uh, indie projects on the platform but a lot of kickstarter people will do that too you have a project and then you point out other projects that people are working on but it also helps because it makes it seem like a very viable platform if boom's doing it you know if berserker can make all this money the expanse can make all this money it's like okay this might be the place to go to look for comics and that benefits us i think there's just room it feels like there's room for everybody on kickstarter because you get to promote the book that you're putting out the way you want and it's just a matter of the audience finding it and deciding if it's for them. Yeah, I, got, I, I get what you were saying. I wasn't trying to be an antagonist in, in that question, but it feels <laughs> like when you get a large publisher, it feels like that they're overshadowing the independent creator scene type deals. So. Yeah, I you know, I could see that, but then I've seen so many Kickstarters start while The Expanse was going and they made a ton of money. You know, like Charlie uh, Stickney is a friend of ours, White Ash, I mean, it made like $70,000 nice. and that's more than he's ever made. And that was going on when you had some really big Kickstarters. So that's why I think, you know, it hasn't really affected it yet. I don't know uh, about the future. It feels like there's room enough for everybody. Sounds good to me. I haven't run a campaign in oh God, 15 years, I think. So, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's evolved since when I last did it. 
Yeah, yeah, it's changed. Like how you do it's changed, and um, you know we've we've run a couple before for Voracious, but we wanted to do it a little bit differently this time, where we had it all set and then we were previewing everything before we launched. And actually, Charlie looked over our Kickstarter because he's been so successful with it. And he was really kind to us and, and looked it over and gave us some some pointers and things. And it, it can be a little bit different, like how you present the awards and you know, what people are looking for it might be different from what it was before. It's a lot of work actually, but, uh, but it can be rewarding. I mean, for us, it's great because we funded so quick. So when I, when I supported the campaign, I actually got the digital bundle because I just, it's easier for me. <laughs> like as much as I'd love a, a book mm -hmm. for that, but I, I think I would get more value out of all the comics you have attached to that. A mega bundle or whatever the twenty five dollars. Yeah, it's a big bundle. one. Yeah, so with our friends and stuff. Yeah, you get a lot of comics for that bundle. Yeah, so it looked like some really great comics, and I, I loved your your layout of the campaign itself. I thought everything was was well done. It was eye catching. So you your video was was great as well too. So I you Thanks. did everything that that drew me in as a as a perspective. It was just a very well done campaign. So the fact that you're how many days left in it? It's twenty. 23 or 22. So a fair amount <laughs> left. Yeah, yeah. It feels like we just did it not too long ago. It's really crazy to us because we thought, oh, we're going to fund it towards the end, maybe. You know, that being optimistic. We're always talking about worst case scenario, like, oh, it's not the end of the world. We could do something else. But nope, it funded in 23 hours. And now we've got two stretch goals crushed and we're all getting close to the third one now. What's uh, the third one? The third one, we're going to put spot gloss on the covers and you're going to get a ribbon bookmark. And then we're going to unlock by the Horns Dark Earth volume PDF. You already got it because you have the digital bundle. But people have been asking for that for an add-on. We're going to do that. So for like a few bucks more, you can, you can add it on. Value is something that when you, especially when you go to campaigns, you know, you're, you're looking for value for your dollar. And I think that's a given no matter if you're going to say, your website to purchase the comic, or if you're going to scouts as creative people, you already have a brand, you already have an established base of fans enjoying your work itself. Looking at your campaigns when you first started to where you are currently and yourself as a creative person, how have you improved yourself from a social media standpoint or gathering more interest towards what you created? That's a, that's a pretty good question. Um, yeah, I hate social media, <laughs> so, to be honest with you. It is a very useful tool uh, for getting the word out. So I definitely try to put a lot more into it than I than I did before, especially when you're doing like hashtags and you know, now we're doing videos and things. And, uh, you know, I always try to talk to comic stores and try to do some more outreach for like I'm in person as well. So yeah, all that stuff's really important because yeah, Scout's going to post things, but they're not going to show the same kind of love for the book that we are. We're passionate about it. So all the posts, I think if it comes from us as creators to show how much we we really love the book and what we're trying to, to give the audience, um, that makes a difference. And I think a lot of what has changed this time around is I, I feel like we're more of a part of a community. Mm. With Voracious, I felt like we were more in a, a bubble but now I feel like I've met so many people in the comics community, creators and readers and retailers online through social media and lots of uh, sites who may have been really interested in voracious and reviews are still following us now and by the horns. And then there's other sites now that have really started to enjoy our work. And so I feel like we have a connection more with the, the community of uh, comics readers and journalists and things than we did before. For example, you know, I, I want to do some interviews for, for the Kickstarter for issue seven, because we've been, the book hasn't been in comic shop in a couple of months, few months, because we had to take time to, to build more issues up because 12 issues, we're not really getting paid. So like, we gotta, we gotta take a break, do some freelance work and then come back to it. I asked people to, if they want to do interviews, we, you know, we've got a lot of interviews and I'm happy to do every single one of them. You know, I want to to talk about our story. I'm so into it. I, I love doing By the Horns. I love the characters. I, I want to finish the whole book. It's going to be 40 to 50 issues. Yeah, I think so. I think that's changed. I think 
when I said I hate social media, it's something from before. I've come to more like embrace it as a tool, but also a way to interact with, with people I really like or who are into comics and have a kindred spirits, you know, if you will. How did you approach Scout Comics or did Scout Comics approach you to get By the Horns uh, published? And, and how else have they helped you uh, from a publisher, uh, the creator standpoint? Right. Um, we approached them. Um, Jason and I worked on the first issue, did the first issue, and then and we pitched it. Um, it was kind of nuts, though, because we were pitching in the pandemic. So I don't know if you remember, Kurt, but like there was that time where all these comic shops were shutting down and we didn't know if the comics industry was just going to implode. So we were like, oh, man, this is the worst possible time. So we only pitched maybe three companies. Uh, but Scout was actually my first choice because I just liked the way that they had started setting up new initiatives. I liked some of the books that they were doing. Um, at the time, they weren't that, they didn't have that many books. Now Scout's exploded. Ever since we signed with them, they have just been putting out book after book and doing lots of new um, um, stuff and just um, trying different things and, and, and trying to be a real force in the, in the industry. But when we first signed with them, I liked the idea that it was a little bit smaller, maybe we'd get a little bit more attention and they would maybe try some some creative things with their book to, to, to get it out there. So they were always my first choice. So we pitched it to them and, um, you know, pretty, pretty quickly they got back saying that they wanted the book. And um, yeah, and it was great to, to work with them, sign on the contract and that. Uh, and uh, you were off to the races. We had already worked on uh, multiple issues by that point. So just how Jason and I usually do. And some people will just do like six pages and pitch it. But if we're going to do a book, we believe in that book. So we're getting the book out there somehow. You know what I mean? I'm not, I don't write a book and then say, oh, let's see if it sticks against the wall. If I write the book, it's going to be, it's going to come out. <laughs> so, um, yeah. What was the other part of your question, Kurt? I forgot. I think yeah, Scott's been good. I mean, they've been, uh, they were, they're less attentive now than they have been because they just have so many books. But we also have an editor now. So Nicole, she was on, I try to get her to come on a podcast with us because you just don't see enough editors get the uh, the recognition they deserve these days. And to me, it, you know, the whole team is responsible for the book. You know, me, Jason, Steve, Nicole, you know, Scout, the production, everybody on there. So um, yeah, I like, I like everybody at Scout and, um, you know, it's been, it's been a good uh, relationship overall, I have to say. What was in your early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, I guess it would be when I started reading fantasy novels. That kind of comes back around to one of your earlier questions, Kurt. When I was a little kid. I got into Conan books and novels when I was about eight or nine years old. I also loved Dungeons and Dragons, and I was crazy for those endless quest books that came out. Like in the 80s, the, the Mountain of Mirrors, the, the Pillars of Pentagon. I love that. But my favorite, my favorite books growing up were, uh, were written by an author named uh, Carl Edward Wagner. His stories really seduced me with language, I would say. He wrote these great yarns about a character named King. And he was this immortal red-haired warrior, like a, a barbarian, but he was also a sorcerer too. And he's cursed by this insane elder god. And he has to walk the earth until he ends up being destroyed by the violence that he creates, which was so cool. And he's skilled and ferocious like Conan, but he's also more thoughtful and devious. And I like that more cerebral approach to a barbarian character. So the way that Wagner used language to weave, to weave in those dark layers with all that action just really fascinated me. I had this anthology book that he did featuring short stories of Kane. It was called Death Angel Shadow. I love this book so much. I would read it every single day. It was one of those pocket sized books. It was, you know, trade paperback, like about that big. I can't generally say about it, like that big. I would take it with me everywhere I went. I'd put it in my back pocket and I carried that thing around and read it until it fell apart in my hands. That's how damn powerful the words 
and the language was in that book. Did you find another copy uh, recently or have you searched for another copy? Yes, I have. I have another one. I don't have the one that I had because they had different covers. It has a, the other thing that really intrigued me has a Rosetta cover, which I actually have um, like an archival poster of that cover. It's a, it's Kane and he's got a sword and he's holding it out with a shield up and there's this, this black ape-like creature coming out of a cave and he has flippers for some reason. I don't know. But it's like the coolest image. I love just looking at that. I think that's what drew me to the book to begin with. That's how I got into comics too, by seeing covers. I need to have this. And then of course I got I got sucked into the stories later. Um, but I, so I have a version of it, actually an older version of it than the one I had, but I would like to get the cover that I originally had, which uh, was like an orange cover. And then the, the image was a box in the middle. The one I have is like a full cover. We all got into sci-fi and fantasy and our different genres that we enjoy in, in different ways. For me, it was Dragonlance. That was my oh yeah. That was my whole Heinlein to Asimov to Dragonlance. Mm -hmm. Like I literally read everything. That's cool. how old were you, Kurt, when you were getting into that? Oh, I was uh, probably like eleven or twelve when I got into Dragonlance. My dad lived in Toronto, so I would go up there and we'd just peruse the old bookstores. Just go oh, down yeah, nice. everywhere and just kind of, and, and that's where I got my, my the first three original copies of the Dragonlance series, and was, mm -hmm. I just got hooked ever since then. And uh, yeah, it's the same for me because my mom is a voracious reader, still is. She reads like I don't know, same like eight books a week or more, maybe more than that. Um, she does mostly on a Kindle now, mm -hmm. but um, she, we would go to the mall a lot, and they had a couple of bookstores in the mall. And one of them was like one of those kind of old school type yeah. bookstores, not not the shiny Barnes and Noble, <laughs> but you know, little crusty bookstore. And I love going in that thing because you could find some really neat stuff, especially fantasy and sci-fi, which has always been my preferred genre. Even now, like if I'm going to read a book, I read a, a few books a year. I, I probably read about ten to fifteen books a year. Um, and they're almost all sci-fi fantasy. What I've always loved is what I've gravitated towards. Okay. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most bullshit piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? Oh, yeah. Second wisest. That, that, that is an interesting question because <laughs> you never, I don't know if you ever go down to that level. You always kind of think of that first one. But I'm going to say, don't start, none won't be none which means if you don't start any trouble, there won't be any trouble. Now, I am a champion for social issues and human rights, for sure, but I use this advice when it comes to social media. So, um, so you're never, you're probably not gonna see me um, weighing in on current events on Twitter or telling the world what I hate about the newest Marvel film on Instagram, it's just not, me, I'd rather talk about positive things and celebrate successes than call out shortcomings or or whine about what kind of beverage I don't like. I'm just I'm not I'm not like that. So I don't really want to invite people to come on and just give me their random opinions about things. So um, yeah, that's something that uh, you know it was not said to me for social media uh, when I was younger, but uh, I kind of apply it to. To it now. So you're an anti hot anti hot taker, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not like I don't. I just don't need to talk about you know every episode of The Last of Us and what works and doesn't work. Yeah. You know, um, and because you don't know, I don't have time for it. Like if people get in discussions and all that, and they feel compelled to type things out, I see a lot of comic book creators get caught up in that. I'm like, why would you want to spend time doing that? So, yeah, I'm not like that. Everyone has one person that inspires them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Yeah, I'd say it was my, my mama. Hmm. Before she retired, my mom was a physical therapist, and she ran a department of therapists and nurses at a hospital. And she was on the New York board that helped to make health laws. But she had been a stay-at-home mom who took care of me and my brother when we were growing up. Something she decided to do to take care of us because my dad worked long hours and she just wanted us to have a stable, supportive presence. 
And that's exactly what she was. She was, um, and has always been an amazing mom, but, you know, somewhere along the way, she also wanted to make a career. She wanted to do something for herself. So when my brother and I got older, she went back to school and became a physical therapist while still raising us in her mid mid mid-30s, something like that. So many people have dreams and they can't reach for them or they they don't want to reach for them or they don't have the will to make them real. But my mom did that. It's not an easy thing to try and learn something new, Um, especially when you're older, when you've already built a comfortable life. It's not easy to balance studying something as complex and hard as physical therapy with all the other responsibilities that she had to our family, but she accomplished it. She earned straight A's, she got a job, and then over the course of her career, she excelled way beyond what other therapists accomplished. So that's just incredibly inspiring to me, to a lot of people who worked with her in the industry. And so because of my mama, I believed that I could break into comics. Uh, I'm a little older, I'm not not a spring chicken anymore. My goal was to break into comics when I decided I was gonna do it before I was 40. So I started writing them when I was 38, And then we signed the contract for Voracious when I was 39. It's never too late to do what really matters to you, you know? You just have to have that passion and uh, and the drive. So my mom instilled that in me. And now I believe anything I set my mind to, I believed that for a long time, that I can accomplish that. And I just, I never give up. And it's because I I watched her do that. I I watched her decide that she was going to do something else and then accomplish it and then succeed beyond her own expectations, actually. So yeah, my mama. Love you, Mama. From a professional standpoint, you have created multiple comics series. You have worked well with Jason in the past and continue to work well with him in the future. And you are now on yet another amazing campaign that is completely funded. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. And you're also published currently by Scout Comics. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I actually don't really think of my life in professional terms, to be honest with you. It's all personal to me. <laughs> so I write because I have stories in my head and getting them out just makes me who I am. So I am in the best spot I can be on a personal level, I think. My wife, Tracy, and I, we, we've built a great life together over the last 14 plus years. Our anniversary is actually this Saturday. Uh, 12th anniversary. I mean, she's the reason I'm even writing comics. Speaking personally, um, I I worked an office job as an editor. I was uh, the editor-in-chief. It was not a great job. I was there a couple of years and it's because I spent so much time doing things for people who just cared more about their careers and having power than they they did about people. And I worked really long hours. I really elevated the company in certain levels, certain ways, foster a lot of communication between different departments. And I never got the recognition for any of that. And it was just really draining, Kurt, like, especially because I had no time to be creative. So one day I I decided I had had enough and I needed to quit. And I called Tracy and, and I told her what I was thinking, told her, I think I have to leave this job. And she didn't even bat an eye. She just said, you should do it. And she didn't even really give any thought to like what the impact would be financially or anything like that. She just cared about me. And that was eight or nine years ago now. And I think it was the best personal decision I've made because I've been very happy ever since. I'm doing freelance work. I'm doing comics. I think that deciding to take a stand and and change your circumstances in order to be happy is probably one of the greatest personal successes anyone can have. And it's not always easy to do that. But I'm glad I made that choice. And also my cat Zoso is is very happy about it because he's completely spoiled and I get to see him all the time. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Failures? What are are those, Kurt? (laughs) You know, I'm not the kind of guy who dwells on something when it doesn't go my way. So if there's an outcome I don't like and I have the power to fix that without hurting anybody, and I don't want to hurt anybody, I would do that. Um, I think of myself as a problem solver. I love trying to fix stuff and tackle things proactively. It's the way I am. So um, if for some reason I can't, then I would accept it and and move on from it. So I think there's very few people in life who don't run into 
a lot of obstacles or make mistakes or, or have setbacks. Everybody does. It's just part of, uh, of living. So I personally choose to view those kinds of barriers as, as learning experiences. I'm happy to, to take the, the bad with the good and roll with the punches. So yeah, I have, uh, I'm trying to think of something as like, I consider like a huge, huge failure and I can't, I can't think of it because I either turned it around or I accepted it and then did something better. But yeah, it's a fair question. Second last question is this. <clears throat> The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired but creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic creator, writer, or something creative, maybe that you've inspired in some way, shape, or form. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Yeah, I'd say they need to be willing to help the next generation by always being open, by sharing what they've learned, and just leading by example. From my own experience, I've done a few presentations for Classroom, and the kids are just so interested and excited about how I make comics because they don't always realize what goes into building stories and channeling creativity. They have all these questions about the inner workings, and they just love to do what I do, which is weird. I don't have kids. I think it's important to be available as a resource, to be patient with them, to be attentive, but also be encouraging. Because I can't tell you how many times I tried talking to comic book creators when I was a kid and even as an adult at a con and they couldn't even be bothered to answer a question. So that kind of thing can really break a kid's spirit. You know, it can change their whole perception of not only who you are, but also what comic book creators in general are like. I'll never do that. You know, I'll always give people my time and, and I hope that the, the future generations, uh, if they're interested in inspiring the generation after them, they do that too. You take the time to impart what you've learned and to, to answer questions and to just share what's so great about making comics or anything creative, to be honest, and why that's just is valuable, not just to you, but uh, the culture, really. If your life was a comic book, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? <laughs> life was a comic book, what would its title be? Oh, man. I don't, the soundtrack would definitely be metal. It's always mm -hmm. going to be metal. Maybe I'd throw a little bit of ambient music in there. I do listen to a lot of like spacey ambient music when I'm writing, especially, but as a host on the Metalheads podcast, I, you know, I'm just in a deep, deep well of metal. What would it be titled? That's a really good question. I had nothing's coming to mind here. By the sword. <laughs> That's pretty metal. Well, Marcuson, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it, Kurt. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where's the Kickstarter campaign? And of course, anything else you'd like to promote? Uh, yeah, you can check out my uh, website at marcuson.com. Uh, I'm Darth Son on Twitter, Darth Marcuson on Instagram. Uh, if you want to stay in the know about By the Horns, you can follow us on social media there. Our handle is By the Horns Comic on all platforms. Uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. The By the Horns Kickstarter is for a deluxe edition hardcover, and it's it's already funded, funded in 23 days. Woo Got some really cool things on there, like we have real drinking horns mm -hmm. with a hand-carved symbol uh, that our lead character, Elodie, has in her jacket, hand-carved into the horn. Bottle openers and all kinds of cool, fun uh, merch there. And uh, we've already gone past two stretch goals and we're going for the third one. And um, it ends uh, at the very end of March. Last day in March is the last day of the Kickstarter. Just go to Kickstarter and search for By the Horns and we'll see it. You can listen to the Metalheads podcast, since I mentioned that a little bit earlier, on your favorite podcast app or just go to metalheadspodcast.com to play the episodes. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. There might be some website issues just as a heads up. So that's why I point everyone towards my YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. The podcast is back after 13 years which you can find on twogeekstalking.podbean.com or any audio streaming service that you can search for because it's literally going to be the only show available called Two Geeks Talking. That's called branding people. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening watching on Two Geeks Talking.